Good to see all of you here today. We've been embarking on a series this week called Hermeneutics. And we've looked at hermeneutics from various different perspectives. The first couple of days we spent time talking about the concept itself that uh, the real student of God, the Bible student, wants to lean in, give attention to the things of the Word of God, wants to have a heart that's open to the Word of God. Uh, it's not about uh, trying to satisfy an agenda or try to look at a scripture to try to prove a point. It's about understanding the true meaning of the passage. How do we get a proper exegesis of scripture to glean out of the passage what the Word of God really means? We've talked about Bible versions in relationship to that. To understand a good Bible student, it doesn't matter what version you're using. You're going to have to study it. You're going to have to put forth mental effort. You're going to have to understand what the words mean and how the sentences are constructed and what's the meaning of the passage. Words mean things. So they've been translated out of other languages into a language we can understand. What a blessing that is. And hopefully you appreciate the Word of God that much more. Uh, in these studies. We talked about moral choices, but we talked about that from a standpoint of hermeneutics. When we approach the Word of God, the goal is, is that it really truly affect our lives, that it changes us. Uh, Timothy just led that song that said, changing you, changing me. These are ancient words that can really make a difference in our life from a hermeneutic standpoint, but if all they are are words on a page so we can win an argument, we're really not living the larger message of Jesus Christ. We're not living uh, the way that we need to live, something's wrong with our hermeneutic. Something's wrong if all we're doing is spitting scriptures out and it's not touching our lives. So we're talking about good, being good Bible students. Our theme overall this week is I want to know more. And Brother Chase has been talking about I want to know more about a lot of different things. I want to know more about the Word of God. I want to know more about heaven. I want to know more. And what a theme this week. And I think it, uh, the, the messages have dovetailed well. Today I want to talk to you the message is called, What Must I Do to Be Saved? Probably one of the most important questions you will ever ask uh, yourself. And as a Bible student, it's an important thing to make sure that you're understanding the Word of God about this subject and that we're looking at the subject from a hermeneutic perspective. What does the Word of God teach? And what does it teach in its entirety? It's a complex issue at times. It's very easy to get in a discussion with somebody and we pick and choose a verse and say, my verse beats your verse and, and all those kind of things. The goal is we want to understand the Word of God. So let's look at this question, what must I do to be saved? Second Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning at verse number 8 says, In flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of our Lord and from the glory of his power. This verse says that those that obey not the gospel will be punished with everlasting destruction. So when we talk about obeying the gospel, that's an important question. What do I need to do to be saved? What is it that obeying the gospel means? Because if I don't obey the gospel, I'm, in, I'm subject to destruction. I'm subject to eternal condemnation. I don't want to be in that situation. First Peter chapter 4 says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Now I just want you to notice a couple of things from a hermeneutic standpoint. Looking at these passages... He talked about judgment beginning in the house of God. And then he compared that, what if, if it began at the house of God, what's going to be the end of those that don't obey the gospel? Now I want you to notice from that perspective, the person that doesn't obey the gospel is not a part of the house of God. Okay, He's making a contrast. He's comparing these things. The last part of that verse, if the righteous scarcely be saved, here's one, one side, the righteous, where shall the sinner and the ungodly appear? So you've got the sinner and ungodly is not the same as the righteous. You've got the house of God's not the same thing as those that obey not the gospel. And you want to make sure you're analyzing that. But the ultimate meaning of this verse is, is if judgment begins with the children of God, what's going to happen to the ungodly? What's going to happen to those that don't obey the gospel? And we know from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, that's, that destruction is there. We want to make sure that we have obeyed the gospel. It's an important question for us as Bible students. What is the gospel? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 4 gives probably a very good clinical definition of the gospel. Now understand from a hermeneutic standpoint, we're looking at all the verses related to the subject. And I say all the verses. We're looking at a 
multitude of verses related to the subject. But as a Bible student, you want to look at all the verses. You want to make sure that, they, they, that the total picture makes sense. 1 Corinthians 15 gives a definition of the gospel. He said, moreover, brethren, Paul's writing to Corinth, and he said, I declare unto you the gospel. He said, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. I just want you to analyze the verse for just a moment. He preached the gospel to them. What was it that he preached? He said, they received it. What was it that they received? And then he says, they were standing in it. What is it that they were standing in? Well, they were standing in the gospel. They had received the gospel. He preached to them the gospel. What is the gospel? Look at verse number two. By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. So I want you to notice again, from a hermeneutic standpoint, the same thing that he preached was the same thing they received. It was the thing they were standing in, and it's the thing they're going to be saved by. The gospel saves. That makes sense to... To our passage in Thessalonians, it said that destruction has come to those that don't obey the gospel. In this case, the gospel saves you. It's important to listen to the gospel and important to be obedient to the gospel. It was what was preached to them was the gospel. So what was it that was preached to them? Look at verse number three. And he tells us, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. Paul says, I'm telling you what was given to me. I was telling you what I was told to tell you. I'm giving you as an apostle what I was instructed to teach the churches. And here it is. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he arose again the third day according to the scriptures. Do you know what the gospel is? Gospel means good news or God's spell. Good news. You know what the good news is? The good news is Christ died, was buried, and arose again. Do you know why that's good news? Because if you're like me, you have a sin problem. And that sin problem needs help and it needs Christ. And that is good news for us. God sent his only begotten son to this earth to die for our sins. Christ died, he was buried, and he arose again. Now, they received that. They stood in that. And they were saved by that. You say, well, how were they saved by the Jesus Christ died, buried, and rose again? That's the reason from a hermeneutic standpoint, you want to look at the subject from all the different angles and make sure you're understanding what the message of the gospel truly is. Let's analyze the question, what must I do to be saved? What implies something must be done. Must implies necessity. That means there's no choice. It has to be done. I implies personal responsibility. I can't do it for you. You can't do it for me. I am responsible. So my mom and dad and their belief system is not going to save me. What must I do to be saved? I implies personal responsibility. Do implies action. There's something that has to be done. Whatever that is, something has to be done. And to be saved implies that there is a reason for, or a need for salvation, meaning there's a sin problem. So what must I do to be saved? A very important question to analyze when it comes to uh, a, a good Bible student that's leaning in, giving attention to the Word of God, and saying, I want to be a student of the Bible. I want to know what does the Bible teach about this subject. The Calvinist says, there, don't do anything you can't. Unless you're one of the chosen, the elect of God, there's absolutely nothing you're going to be able to do about that question. The universalist says, do nothing, there's no use. The moralist says, live a moral life. The modernist would say, follow nature. There is no sin. Whatever nature tells you to do, that's what you do. Denominations in the world would say, in answer to the question, believe in Jesus Christ. Just believe. And that's what you need to do. It's an important question. Now I want to back up just a moment. I want you to recognize that man, the Bible teaches that man is saved by a multitude of things. So when you start as, well, we've been talking about all week long is hermeneutics. You start just picking out a single verse, you may come up with any kind of a conclusion. But we want to look at the subject in totality. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 and 8, man saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. That's what the Bible says, man saved by grace. So I could walk up to you today and you say, well, what do you need to do to be saved? Well, you're saved by grace. And I walk away. And that's a biblical answer. 
It's just not a complete answer. I can take a particular verse out of the Bible and I can say, well, that's a, and, and it still be true, but that's not a complete answer. The Bible also says that man is saved by the word of God. Look at James 1 and verse number 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. God's word saves. So I could walk up to you today and you ask the question, what do I need to do to be saved? And what saves me? What is it that saves me? I say, the word of God saves you. Believe the word of God. It's a true statement. Nothing wrong with that. But I didn't mention anything about God's grace, did I? But yet grace saves. Grace is an important element in salvation. Can't be saved without the grace of God. Calling on the Lord. The Bible says we'll save you. Acts 2 and 21, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, you come up to me and you say, what do I need to do to be saved? Call on the name of the Lord. Now, that's a true answer. It may not be a complete answer, but it's a true answer. A hermeneutic, a good Bible student with a proper hermeneutic is going to look at the subject in a more totality, of a larger viewpoint than just pulling a verse and trying to whip somebody's argument with a verse. Well, I've got a verse that says grace saves me. Well, I have one that says calling on the name of the Lord saves you. You can't be saved without calling on the name of the Lord, but you can't be saved without the grace of God. Yet you can go around circles all day long. The reality is all those things are true and they need to be involved in our salvation. Uh, man saved by believing. Look at the passage there in Acts 16 and verse number 31. They said, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. In this particular context, Paul and Silas had been in prison and talked to the Philippian jailer. And and the reality is, and if I could tie this together with the early part of our messages, listen, this is the way that people sometimes will pull a verse out and say, well, all you got to do is believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then you've got somebody else that is a semi-Bible student or whatever that says, well, it doesn't say I have to believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was talking to the Philippian jailer. And, and then you can even go further and get tangently connected to the Bible. Uh, you've got a student that's somewhat, and you go, well, I don't believe the Bible at all because there's not a verse in there that says tie has to do anything. We will never make application to Scripture, and it will mean nothing to you if we get to that point. What we're trying to do is take a restoration view of Scripture and apply it in the 21st century. And the restoration view says, what does the original text say? And the answers that were given to them can be answers for us. It teaches us about the character of God, the mind of God. It teaches us about how the apostles dealt with the first century church, how the church was established, what the doctrines were of the early church, what the theology was of the early church. All of those things are involved with us today. Now, how do we make application? I'm telling you, the best Bible students struggle. It is a struggle. It's not an easy thing to do. But I want to encourage you. It's an honorable process. But the Bible does say, believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a part of the thing that all of those things are involved in our salvation. Romans 8, 24 says we're saved by hope. Well, you walk up to me and say, well, what saves me? And I go, hope. What I need to do to be saved? Hope. And walk out. Is that a wrong answer? Is it an incorrect answer? No, it's a true answer. It's not a complete answer. All of the Word of God. There are several things about the Word of God that we need to recognize take place. First of all, you've got an infancy of the first century church. The book of Acts is a powerful book to show the growth of the church and the establishment of congregations and instruction given to those congregations and epistles of Paul written to explain what those congregations needed to do. And Paul said, I taught the same thing everywhere in every church. That's why it is applicable to us today. That's why we're a church. We're a first century church that's trying to follow apostolic commands. How do we do that? Let's read the writings of Paul. What did he teach about those things when he established those congregations? But is it true that we're saved by hope? Yes. The Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ saves. 1 John 1 and verse number 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. You come up to me and you say, how am I saved? What must I do to be saved? All those things or however we would ask it. What do you think I need to do? Blood of Christ saves. It's a true answer. It's not a complete answer. All of these things are involved in our salvation. Somebody says, what do I need to do to be saved? Your answer might be baptism. 1 Peter 3.21 
says the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Does baptism save? Yes. You walked up to me and said, what do I need to do to be saved? Go, you need to be baptized. Is that an accurate answer? Yes. Is it a complete answer? No. And I'm telling you, the really good Bible student, the, the Bible student that's attentive, the Bible student that's leaning in, that says, what do I need to do? How does the Word of God work? All that sort of stuff. The really good Bible student is not going to say baptism. It, because the issue is more complex than that. Somebody gets dipped in water and walks away, and that's all they understand about the Word of God. They don't understand what's going on. They don't understand the Scriptures. They don't understand how the Scriptures work. Is baptism important? Of course it is. But it's one of many things that we're saved by. This question, what must I do to be saved, was asked three different times in Scripture. And there were three different answers given to the same question. I want to look at those instances for just a moment. Acts 16 and 30, we talked about a moment ago. Paul and Silas were in prison. They were singing praises unto God. The prisoners heard them. There was an earthquake, so the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately, everyone's bands were loosed. And the doors were open. And... The prison keeper, which was the jailer, came in and supposing that the prisoners had be, been fled, Paul cried out with a loud voice and he said, do thyself no harm for we're all here because the prison keeper, the jailer, had drew out his sword and was going to kill himself. He said, don't do yourself any harm. Don't hurt yourself. We're all here. We're all accounted for. And the, and the jailer came in and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, it's an important question to analyze. Number one was he saying, what do I need to be, do to be saved physically? That doesn't make sense, right? There's common sense involved. It doesn't make sense because he was just saved physically like three seconds beforehand. When they said, don't, don't draw your sword, don't kill yourself. You know, we're all here. He was just saved physically. But this jailer had been hearing them pray and sing and all those things all night long. He knew there was something else. Something spiritual about Paul and Silas. What do I need to do to be saved? He's asking, spiritually speaking, what do I need to do to be saved? So the question was asked, and there was an answer given. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the Jewish people had just recently crucified the Messiah. Peter gives what we call the first gospel sermon, and he recounts a lot of the history of the Jewish people. And at the end of that story, he said, This Jesus whom ye have crucified is both Lord and Christ. And they were pricked in their heart. They recognized they had crucified the Messiah. The very one they had been looking for to come, they had now crucified. They were pricked in their heart. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What, what do we do about this? We've just crucified the Messiah. What do we do? And there was an answer given to that question. And it was a different answer than what was given to the Philippian jailer. Saul of Tarsus. There's three times the story of Saul of Tarsus is recounted in Scripture, at, at minimum of three times. Three times in the book of Acts. Paul recounted it in other instances as he wrote epistles and wrote to churches. But three times. One of those was Acts chapter 9. One of those was Acts chapter 22. One of those is Acts chapter 26. Okay, he's standing before King Agrippa in Acts 26. He said, I think myself happy. I love the King James there. I think myself happy uh, to answer before thee this day, touching all the things wherever I'm accused of the Jews. Okay, I'm happy to stand before you and tell you what it is that has happened. But Saul of Tarsus is on the road to Damascus. He's going to bind Christians, to, to arrest Christians, to bring them back to Jerusalem to be punished. And he comes in contact with the Lord. And in verse number 6 of Acts chapter 9, he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So we've got three different instances this question was asked. There was an answer given to Saul. It's a different answer than what was given in, on the day of Pentecost, and it was a different answer than what was given uh, in the case of uh, the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16. Three different times the question was asked. And three different answers were given. To the Philippian jailer, here was the answer. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ or believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's what he told the Philippian jailer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. 
On the day of Pentecost, at, when the Jews had crucified the Messiah and they said, what do we need to do? Here was their answer. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then in that third instance, Saul of Tarsus, he said, what do I need to do? What would you have me to do? Uh, here's the answer. And now why tears thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's what Ananias told him when he went and met after the Lord had told him to go meet Ananias and he'll tell you the things you need to do. Ananias said, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, if you're not a good Bible student, you'll take one of those stories and you'll give the answer to one of those stories, right? If you've got a poor hermeneutic, you're going to take just a part of that and my scripture trumps your scripture. I've got one scripture that says, believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've got another scripture that says, repent and be baptized. I've got another one that says, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So I've got one that says I need to believe, one that says I need to repent, one says I need to be baptized, have my sins washed away. I guess two of them say baptism for the remission of sins. And it's real easy as a Bible student as a not very good Bible student to just pick and choose these verses. And the reality is we need to understand the situation. A, herm a proper hermeneutic is looking at the context, is looking at the situation around it and analyzing the answers and, and making sure we're including all of that in our analyzation of the subject. Now this didn't even include 1 Peter chapter 3 and we're saved by hope and we're saved by the blood of Jesus and we're saved by all those saved by the grace of God, Ephesians 2 and 8, all those things apply as well. But let's look at these three answers for just a moment. You've got on the very first one of these in Acts chapter 16, you've got the Philippian jailer who didn't believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You could tell him to be baptized all day long, but if he didn't believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, there would be no reason to take the next step to baptism. And if you look at the story in Acts 16, the first thing he did was believe and they took him the same hour of the night, washed his stripes, and was baptized. If you take it in its entire context, you see repentance in the other aspects in that story. Now, the second one were the Jews on the day of Pentecost. They already believed they were Jewish people that had believed they had just crucified the Messiah. They weren't need, it, it wasn't needed to tell them to believe. They already believed. What did they need to do? Repent and be baptized. And then the third instance that we look at is Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9. What do I need to do to be saved? We're talking about a guy, if you look at the story and you read the entire context, he's been praying for three days, had lost his sight after he met the Lord. For three days he's praying. A believer, he met the Lord on the road to Damascus. He already believed. For three days he's been praying. You want to talk about a repentant heart? Now I will tell you also, if, you, if prayer for three days won't wash your sins away, your sins aren't going to be washed away by prayer. Three days of prayer. We're already talking about an individual that had a repentant heart. And he was told to arise, be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's what Ananias told him to do. Well, if you've already believed and you've already repented, what would be the answer? To, to arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And that's the beginning of the journey. That's not the rest of the Bible story. We need the rest of it as well. And you'll see in Paul's life the change that was made and the continual working for the church that took place. All those things weigh into that story. And if we're very simplistic and all we want to do is just take a verse, then we're going to take a verse that says, well, you just need to believe. Well, if I'm telling you this morning to believe and you already believe, that makes no sense. If I'm telling you this morning, though, if you've believed but you've never repented, to repent and be baptized, that makes sense. If Let's say that this morning you believe, you've repented, you've confessed the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, but you've never been baptized, then it makes sense to say you need to be baptized. But all of those things are encompassed in the subject, and we have to look at the Bible and look at the subject in its totality. We can't just pick and choose verses and pluck a verse out of context and say, well, that's what it says. Because that's when you get the argument back that says, well, it didn't say I ought to do that. It said that Saul of Tarsus needs to do that. That was just specifically for Saul of Tarsus. Well, if I pull a verse out, it was to Saul of Tarsus. But it doesn't recognize the fact that it was also given to the Jews on the day of Pentecost. It was also given to Saul of Tarsus, also given to the Philippian jailer, and multiple other people in examples of conversion. And... It doesn't take into example the fact that Christ told his disciples to go preach it to the world and everybody in the world that hears it, believes it, obeys it, and is baptized will be saved. 
If you take all of that in its context, then we see the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. That's good news for us. And we need to go preach that gospel so people can come in contact with the blood of Christ. There's a lot of things that weigh into the subject. Christ was baptized. Christ commanded baptism. The apostles taught baptism. The New Testament church practiced baptism. Uh, Matthew 28, verse number 19, that uh, great commission tells us who it is that's a candidate for baptism. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Do you know who's a good candidate for baptism? Somebody that's been taught. If you've not been taught, you, we may not even be to the spot of talking baptism because you need to understand what baptism is about. You see how the subject is more complex than sometimes what we do is we, we study the Bible on a very superficial level. We have a kind of, uh, I'm going to say, elementary approach to the Word of God and we don't see it from its larger perspective. And we'll come up with different conclusions if that's what we're doing. You know, when I was raising children, or when Lisa and I was raising children, or, or were raising children, um, I'll give Lisa some credit in here, but you know, when our kids were young, there were things we would say to them like, uh, that's a bad word. Don't use that word. We don't use that word. That's a bad word. As the years went on, let's say the kids were four or five years old, six years old or something, we're sitting at the dinner table. My mother-in-law sitting at the dinner table and she said the word S-T-U-P-I-D. And my girls went, ah, that's a bad word. And my mother-in-law, if you know her at all, most godly, Christian, amazing woman, she went, ah, what did I say? Oh, I just used a bad word. And then my children said, you said the S word. She goes, I did not. <laughs> right? You understand that when children are children, we teach elementary principles about that's a bad word. It's all black and white, if you'll notice. That's a bad word. That's a good word. And a lot of things about raising children, it's black and white in a child's mind. As they begin to grow and mature, though, what do we teach them? The nuance of language. We teach them deeper knowledge about language. That there are some words that are bad words that we might put in as curse words or that kind of thing. There are inappropriate words. There are words that are not socially acceptable. There are words that are not courteous. There are words that are, you see what I'm saying? We divide that up into a deeper understanding about what is a good word and what's a bad word. I'm not recommending that somebody use the word S-T-U-B-I, I can't spell it, S-T-U-P-I-D. I'm not recommending using the word. I'm just saying that there's a different level of words. We teach our children a deeper understanding. We teach them nuance and understanding about how language is formed and how they use language. And that happens with maturity. It happens with growing up. And all of the world is not quite as black and white. It's got gray and it's got, and I don't mean gray in the sense of morals and ethics, but I mean it's not black and white in the sense of how language is used. It's not either a bad word or a good word. Sometimes there's words in between that just, they may not quote unquote be evil bad, but they're not appropriate for social settings or whatever those type of things might be. Um, I hope that makes sense. I hope you, people do that with the Bible, though. We've got a lot of folks that have a very elementary, very superficial, very childish view of Scripture. And, it, and if you catch yourself doing the, I've got a verse and it trumps your verse, that's a very elementary view of Scripture. We really have to encourage people to be better Bible students. That are, that are opening up the Word of God, looking at subjects from totality, not to try to, to defend a position, not trying to justify behavior. You know, a lot of times people will get involved in sin and they'll do everything they can to justify why they're there. And sometimes people even try to even say there's not a God or whatever, but you know why they say there's not a God? They don't want to be held accountable to a God. And, and just because somebody's making that argument, sometimes the arguments are very superficial. It's not that they've really studied it or whatever. It's just words that come out of their mouth because it's the convenient thing to justify their own actions. Be careful. 
I just want to warn us, don't be that kind of Bible student. Be the kind of Bible student that leans in, that gives attention to the Word of God, that truly wants to understand the subject. I told you early in the week about a story with my son-in-law, and I'm going to repeat it because it's applicable. This is what I'm talking about. I've told you all, you know, I enjoy a good Bible discussion. I enjoy winning a good Bible discussion. I mean, that's, you know, the human side of me. That's fun, and I grew up doing a lot of that kind of stuff. But I tell you what, I've spent the older years of my life trying to get away from doing that. I don't want to do that. And I don't want to encourage our people to do that. I don't want to encourage our young men to do that. But I'm driving down the road with Michael and he's making an argument about a particular passage of scripture and he's arguing the point. I can tell you the subject, but I won't do that because we can talk about it later or whatever, but he's arguing a position. And I will tell you his argument wasn't necessarily a bad argument, but he was young at the time he didn't know the nuance of the argument and and understand and so i took some of the nuance of the argument and kind of took it back at him and i've been doing this a long time so from some experience level you kind of know how to win an argument and go well what about this question you know, I'll, I'll ask you the question you can't answer you know kind of thing and throw it at him well he hadn't thought about it yet and he was just young you know he's 18 to 20 years old or whatever at the time and we're driving down the road, and I'll be honest with you, I laid in bed that night feeling guilty about it. Because I don't want to do that with the Word of God. I honestly don't want to do that. I know there's a human side of all of us that feels the compulsion or, com- you know, we're compelled to try to win or whatever. But I really do not want to do that with the Word of God. I told him the next day or a few days later, I said, Michael, I said, I really do apologize. And I said, you've got a good argument. And I said, let me help you develop the argument because you, there's nothing wrong with your argument, but you need to understand some of the nuance, you need to understand some of the things that's in between, but you've got to, but I feel bad, I do not need to do that to you. And what I just did to you is wrong. It's not what needs to happen. We need, I don't want Michael to perpetuate a generation of people that are arguing a point based upon a, You know, I'm going to pull a verse out here that you can't answer and then that proves my point or whatever. Or through technique, I win an argument. Or through manipulation, I win an argument. I don't want to do that. I don't want to perpetuate that. I don't want it to be perpetuated to another generation. And I don't like the fact that I have a tendency to want to do that. We get together at preacher meetings at times. I love it and it's great guys and they all love the Word of God. We'll spar with one another and all that can be fun and all that. But I'll be honest with you. It's not really good. That's not a good way to study the Bible. It's not. Winning an argument is not understanding the Bible. There's a difference in those two things. And we've got to develop a more mature, deeper understanding of the Word of God and be better students of the Word of God than just to try to win an argument by by pulling something out of context or whatever or manipulating something to win. It's not about winning. It's about understanding the Word of God and being obedient to the Word of God. Okay, so that being said, who is it that's a good candidate for baptism? One that's been taught. One that's believed. Mark 16, 15, 16 is the other gospel rendering of the Great Commission. Believe and be baptized in order to be saved. So somebody has to believe. Somebody has to repent. Acts 2, 38 was the instruction given to those Jews on the day of Pentecost. Repent. Okay. So can an infant, well, you have to come to a decision from a hermeneutic standpoint, what about baptizing an infant? And that's something that there are some religious groups that do that. They baptize a small child. Now, this isn't all the subject related to that. We can talk about whether a child is born in sin and whether a child bears the iniquity of their father. There's a lot of things that weigh into the concept of baptizing an infant. Sometimes religious groups do that because they believe a child is born corrupt. They believe they're born with sin and they need to have the sin. I don't believe a child is born with sin. I believe a child is born in a state of innocence. Innocence is lost once they sin, but I don't believe they bear the iniquity of the father, Ezekiel 18. And we have to look at the Bible in its entirety So if I'm coming to a conclusion from a hermeneutic standpoint, who needs to be baptized? I would say, well, it's not infants because an infant couldn't, I guess they could hear the word of God. They wouldn't be able to understand it, but they hadn't been taught. They don't understand the word of God at this stage. So they're being baptized to something they don't even understand. It's, It's happening to them. They're not making a decision about it. Could they believe? Well, they're too young to even understand it, much less believe it. 
right? Have they repented? What do they have to repent of? They're infants, they're small children. There's nothing there to repent of. So infants would not be a candidate for baptism, okay? Acts chapter two, verse number 38 says, baptism is for the remission of sins, okay? It's to get remission of sins. Now that's not the only verse there, but you wanna look at that verse. Galatians three says, we're put into Christ when we're baptized. When we're baptized into Christ, we put on Christ, okay? Baptism is to put us into his death. We come in contact with the death of Christ when we're baptized. Know you not that so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. We're, we come in contact with the death of Jesus. Now it starts to clear up for us a little why the gospel is the good news, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul preached it. They received it. They stood in it. They were saved by it. How were they saved by it? Because somehow they had to accept the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They have to come in contact with the death of Jesus. When we're baptized into Christ, we're put into Christ. We come in contact with the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Now, we talked about versions this week from a hermeneutic standpoint and paying attention to the fact that these are translations. I'm not telling you today the King James translation is a perfect translation. I don't believe it is. There are, we like to call them translational difficulties. But uh, there are some translational challenges. And one of those things, to me, the King James has transliterated words. And transliterated words are not translated words. And let me tell you what I mean by that. They take a Greek word. Previous to 1611, when the King James Version came out, uh, there was not a word baptism. If you were going to read that in the Greek and do a word-for-word translation, the word would be translated immersed or dipped, okay? That's what the word means. But previous to 1611, there wasn't even a word baptism. They created a word from the Greek baptizo, and they called it baptism. And the reason why they did it is some people thought sprinkling was baptism. Some people thought pouring was baptism. Some people thought immersion was baptism. And that's what I'm talking about, about being a good Bible student. You need to look at the verses. How does it apply? What do the verses teach about this? That doesn't make the King James Version a bad version. Don't get me wrong. I've, I've told you this week. I love the King James. But I'm saying you have to recognize the fact that they have transliterated a word and called it baptism. Okay? And that left it open for people to say, well, if I believe sprinkling's baptism, then sprinkling's okay. If I believe pouring's baptism, well, pouring's okay. But in reality, the word really means dip or immerse. And you'll see other verses that teach that as well. Romans chapter 6 and verse number 4, we're buried with him by baptism into death. So it doesn't even matter that they change the word to baptism. We have Romans 6 that teaches us what baptism is. It's a burial, okay? And it's a burial in water. John 3, they were baptizing in this particular place because there was much water there. Now, if, if it were sprinkling, if baptism meant sprinkling, you wouldn't need much water. John 3, verse number 23. But we can go to Romans 6 and see it's a burial. We can see that they use much water. In fact, we see in Acts chapter 8 on the uh, story of Philip and the eunuch that went down into the water for baptism. Well, that's hard to do if you're sprinkling and it's hard to do if you're pouring. It's hard to go down into the water in a cup, Right? That would be immersion, okay? They went down into a body of water that was immersion. It was a burial, Romans 6 and verse number 4. They came up out of the water. That's hard to do with sprinkling and pouring, okay? It's a resurrection, Colossians 2 and verse number 12 says. It's a new birth, John 3 and verse number 5 says. It's a planting, Romans 6 and verse number 5 says, we've been planted together in the likeness of his death. We should be also in the likeness of his resurrection. It's a planting as well. Our bodies are washed, is specifically mentioned in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 22. All those things apply to the subject from a hermeneutic standpoint. What We're baptized into what? We're baptized into his name, Acts 8, 16. It's in his name where there's remission of sins. Luke 24, verse number 47, uh, says repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. 
It's in his name where there's remission of sins. It's in his name where there's salvation. Acts 4 and verse number 12 says, There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's in his name where there's the greatest relationship, giving him a name above every name. Okay? We're baptized into his death. Romans 6 verse number 3 through verse number 5 talks about it's in his death where his blood was shed, John 19 and verse number 34. It's in his death where there's remission of sins, Matthew 26 and verse number 28. It's in his death where the New Testament, the new covenant was sealed. The Old Testament was done away with, happened in his death. We participate in that when we're baptized into Christ. We're baptized into Christ. That's one of the things that we're baptized into what? We're baptized into Christ. Galatians 3, 27 it says, for we've been baptized, or if we've been baptized into Christ, we put on Christ. It's in Christ where one is a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 17. It's in Christ where one has redemption, Ephesians 1 and verse number 7. It's in Christ where spiritual blessings are, Ephesians 1 and 3. It's in Christ where there's forgiveness, again, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 7. You know, the Bible says there's one baptism. So if we were asking ourselves the question, is it sprinkling, is it pouring, is it immersion, is it infant, is it all those different things? The Bible says there's one. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Okay? So if we're a Bible student, we're looking at this subject, we want to look at it through that prism and through that framework to understand that coming up with a different answer doesn't make sense to Ephesians chapters, uh, chapter 4 and verse number 5. And then Amos chapter 4 and verse number 12 says uh, uh, the prophet Amos was talking to the people of Israel to the north. This is after a divided kingdom. And he was prophesying destruction for them in the Old Testament. And he said, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Prepare to meet thy God. Well, as a Bible student, I recognize we don't live in the Old Testament, but as a Bible student, I'm going to recognize the character and nature of God. He said we need to be baptized for the remission of our sins. He sent his son to die on a cross of Calvary for our remission of sins. His blood was shed at Calvary for our remission of sins so that we could have salvation. He did all of that for us, and then we ignore it. We probably need to understand the larger picture of the character of God that God wants us to be prepared. God wants us to be ready. God wants us to be touched. God wants us to be saved. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 10, Peter says, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Now, if you're a good Bible student, you want, to, you want your calling and election to be sure. You want to be looking at the scriptures and saying, where do I fit? You want to put personal application. Where do I fit in this picture? Have I been baptized into Christ? Have I come in contact with the blood of Christ? Have I been saved by coming? Did I receive the gospel, the good news? What, did I come in contact with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Romans 1 and verse number 16, the apostle Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You know, I'm a part of everyone. Ty's name may not be mentioned in Scripture. It doesn't say, Ty, go be baptized. But when I'm looking at the Scriptures from a proper hermeneutic, I recognize that everyone can be saved through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is the power of God unto salvation. Have you been saved? Do you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ that, that Christ came, was buried, and rose again the third day? Maybe you believe, but you've never repented. Today, the answer is you need to repent, and you need to come to God. You need to be buried with him in baptism, to rise and walk in newness of life, and live your life faithful to him. Maybe today you're here, and you believe, and you've repented, but you've never been baptized. You're, you really have made a change in your life. You really have, you really are doing things different than you did before. Then the answer isn't to you to repent. You've repented. But the answer may be you've not been baptized. And the answer may need to be. Same question answered three different ways depending on who it is that's asking the question and what condition you're in when the question is asked. This right here is probably one of the most important questions you'll ever answer. And I would dare say it's the most important question you'll ever answer. And I want to encourage you today to honestly be a good Bible student and look at the subject honestly and fairly with a pure heart and say, what does the Word of God teach that I need to do? 
and do your best to come up with a conclusion that makes sense in Scripture. Do your best to be honest and true to yourself and true, honest and true to God. For you to just defend an argument or defend a position, you got to stand before God and win that argument. You don't have to stand before me and win it. I don't have to stand before you and win an argument. I think my ability to manipulate God or to, to take an argument and say, but God, let me, you, you don't understand this part of it. Let me give you the nuance of this argument. He knows the story from the beginning into the end, and he's got a lot more experience than Ty Fleming's got, right? I, I don't want to argue with him. I want to submit to him. Whatever it is his will teaches that I should do.